So I want to talk to the, those of you that maybe at one point or another, you had a goal or a dream, maybe a vision, and it started and you had great anticipation, but you hit some resistance, you hit a roadblock, you got discouraged, you stalled, making very little progress, and frustration set in. You're discouraged, and you feel like giving up. Maybe there was a relationship that you tried to restore, and you reached out to that person, you tried to have a conversation with them that was constructive, and after talking with them, it's actually worse now than it was before. Maybe you're fighting to save your marriage. You're doing everything you can, but you feel like you're just running out of fight. There are certainly some of you, maybe those of you that are watching online, that you're believing for a miracle. You're believing and you're praying for a child to come back to the Lord. You're, you're believing and you're praying for healing, for provision, for, for God to do a miracle in your life, to help you overcome an addiction. You've tried, you've prayed, you've believed, but you haven't seen the results that you want to see, that you need to see, that you hope to see, and now you're discouraged and maybe you're losing hope. Today I want to talk to you those of you that feel like giving up or at one point you felt like giving up and maybe you did give up on something. The title of today's message is When You Want to Give Up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that it is life. Lord, we pray that you would breathe life into our situations, Lord. Those situations where we are discouraged, where we have maybe already given up, but Lord, where you want to do something, would you give us fresh eyes to see? Would you give us a new perspective? Lord, would you breathe new life into those situations? Would you encourage where we are discouraged? Would you help us not to give up? In Jesus' name, amen. So what's the difference between success and excellence? Well, author Angela Duckworth did some groundbreaking research, and she, she looked at a bunch of different successful, uh, not successful, excellent leaders. She looked at military leaders, she looked at teachers, she looked at business leaders, she looked at all sorts of different leaders, and she thought to herself, what's the difference between someone who is successful in their field and someone who is excellent in their field? And she determined the number one quality that she identified as what makes a person excellent in their field is what she calls grit. Grit, she defines as the strength of character that refuses to quit. It means to stick to it. It means to persevere. It means to keep doing. Don't quit. Grit doesn't quit. She says enthusiasm is common, but endurance is rare. Endurance is rare. The difference isn't what you know. The difference isn't even who you know. It's your willingness to stay in the fight. It's your willingness to keep going forward. It's the strength of character that refuses to quit. It's easy to start things, but it is hard to finish them. It is hard to finish them. And so that's why we're predeciding that we need to be finishers we need to be finishers. We are finishers by nature. We're not going to take the easy way out. We're not going to quit when the going gets tough. We're not going to take the path of least resistance. So our decision today is this. When I commit, I don't quit. Why? Because I'm a finisher. I'm a finisher. How do we as disciples of Jesus Christ, how do we uh, persevere when the devil wants us to quit? How do we strengthen our character when everything around us maybe is even telling us to quit? And when we want to quit, how do we strengthen our character? Well, let's look at the words of Apostle Paul here as he gives what might vary, what is a very emotional appeal to his son in the faith, to Timothy, as he writes 2 Timothy. So as he's writing 2 Timothy, he is in prison. And the, uh, the Emperor Nero, at this point in time, had very likely put him in prison, and he was sentenced to be beheaded. And so 
Once in this time and place, once a prisoner is, is on death row, is deemed to be executed, they don't get the privilege of staying in general population. They get sent down to the deepest, darkest, lowest part of the prison. So that was also the sewage. And so Paul is very likely writing this letter in the deepest, darkest part of that prison that he's in, in the sewage. And so I want you to think about that as he's awaiting execution and he's writing this letter. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have remained faithful. Well, Paul says a lot in these few verses. While he's suffering for the Lord, he reminds Timothy to not be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Don't be afraid of it. It's one thing to hear that from someone who's never suffered for the Lord, but it's another thing entirely to hear that from someone who is suffering for the Lord, who has suffered for the Lord, who has suffered a lot for the Lord. Because Paul suffered many times before this. So let's heed the words of Paul here, church. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Oftentimes, we just, especially in this day and age, this culture, we just want to be comfortable. And so anytime there's something that is uncomfortable, we run from that. But we can find Jesus in the suffering. Suffering produces character in us, produces hope. And so don't run from suffering, church. Suffering of any kind is rarely fun, but suffering for the Lord has its reward. And so let me remind you of all the different kinds of suffering that Paul went through in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He lists all the different kinds of suffering. Are there servants are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number. He can't even count the times that he's been whipped and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. i faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. I don't know any other place you can experience deserts or uh, danger. And I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Did Paul suffer? Absolutely he suffered. And he did all of that in the name of Jesus. He suffered for the Lord, very likely more than any of us ever have or ever will. His words hold a lot of weight as he's telling Timothy, don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. So let's look again at our text in 2 Timothy. Note the finishing languages, language that Paul uses. In verse 5, Paul says, fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Don't just start it. Don't just kind of halfway finish it. Fully carry it out. Finish the work. Verse 6 my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. That's very strong past tense language. The time of my death is near. He knows he doesn't have very much time left here on earth. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have remained faithful. Again, really strong finishing language here. More past tense language. Paul never gave up. Paul never quit. Paul never recanted. 
Paul never gave up on God's call on his life. With everything we know of Paul, he did remain faithful. He did remain faithful, and so he said this with full integrity. Paul was in line to be executed. Apart from a miracle, his life would soon be over. And, and yet, here's something amazing. If you were to continue to read on in 2 Timothy, he says later to Timothy, hey, can you grab me my papers? Can you grab me my, my scrolls, my books, and can you bring them to me? While his, he already feels like his life has been poured out, while he feels like he has nothing left to give, he tells Timothy, hey, get my books for me. I need to study. I need to learn because there's still more that the God has for me. I still want to be useful while I'm here. Paul didn't quit. While awaiting execution on death row, he wanted to study more. We may not have access to that teaching, but I fully believe that either as a free man or a man in chains, Paul did everything that he could to advance the kingdom of God. Everything. Paul predecided to fully finish what God had called them to. Because Paul predecided, when I commit, I don't quit. David Allen said in his book, Getting Things Done, that much of the stress that we experience in our lives isn't from the many things that we have to do in our life, that actually a lot of the stress in our lives is from the many things in our lives that are left unfinished. All of those things that are just 60% done, 70% done, 95% done, that is what co is causing a lot of stress in our lives. So could it be that you're so stressed not because you have so much to do, but that there's actually too many things that you've left unfinished? So that begs the question, what's your unfinished business? What's your unfinished assignment? What is it that as a follower of Jesus, God prompted you to do? God asked you to do. You're, you thought you should do. You were going to do. You decided, you know what? I am going to do that. You knew you were supposed to say. You knew you were supposed to give. You were looking to reach out to somebody. What is it that you were prompted to do but you didn't do? You see, it may be a number of different things. Maybe it's that you were called to mend a relationship. You know there's a relationship that's on your heart, that's on your mind, that you know you need to reach out to them. You know you need to restore that relationship. But you just haven't done that yet. Maybe it's to share your faith with somebody. You have an important person in your life that doesn't know Jesus, and you thought, i got to share my faith with them. Maybe that wasn't your thought. Maybe that was the Holy Spirit saying that to you. Maybe you're supposed to give something and you never gave what you were supposed to give. Whatever you felt you were called to do and you've delayed or disobeyed, that is your unfinished business. Think about it. Pray about it. Ask God, God, what, what is my unfinished business? What is God saying to you? He'll remind you. The Apostle Paul gave an excellent challenge to the church in Corinth because they decided they were going to do something, and then they didn't follow through with it. They didn't follow through with it. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 10, we can read here his great challenge to them. Here's my advice. It would be good for you to finish what you started a year ago. Last year, you were the first who wanted to give, and you were the first who began to do it. You were the first to begin, do, begin doing it. Now, you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Now you should finish what you started. We believe that the Bible still speaks to us today, even though it was written to thousands of years ago. Amen? And so the Holy Spirit guided those authors then for the word to be living and alive and so it can still speak to us today. And so I'll ask again, what is your unfinished business? What is it that God prompted you to do that you haven't done yet? Finish what you've started. I recently heard a story of a missionary that 
had heard from God, and she was in a remote part of the world, and she had a small team with her, and she really felt that she heard from God to say, go and reach that people group over there. And so she, she started, and she trained, and she, she needed to get there because she wanted to be obedient to what God called her to do. And so the only way to get to those people was by boat. She didn't have a boat. So the only boat that she could afford was a rowing boat. Now, this is in the ocean. And so that, that would take some serious dedication, some serious training. So for two years, she trained in rowing the boat. She trained in rowing. She built up her stamina, and she desperately wanted to get to those people to tell them about Jesus. And so on the day that she ventured out, for two hours, two straight hours, she fought the tide. She fought the currents, and she tried to get to the, that people group. But after two hours, she was just simply exhausted, could not row a single second more. She was just done. And as soon as she quit rowing, the tide pushed her right back to where she started. And so she she discouraged. She said, God, what do you want me to do? I feel like you want me to be over there, but I don't know how to get over there. God says, get a bigger boat. So this bigger boat came with motors, praise the Lord. And so those motors took her part way, and then the motors died. And so she's sitting there in the middle of the ocean. God, what, do you, what is going on here? What do you want me to do? And she's stuck in the middle of the ocean. The motor's dead on her boat. She doesn't know what to do. I'll finish that story in a moment. But the point of the story is that most people at that point just throw in the towel. We just quit. That's it. I'm done. I've tried. I've tried twice For over two years, I've tried, Lord, to get to them. But maybe this missionary asked herself, as I'm sure you've asked yourself many times before or in different ways, why does it matter if I quit? Why does it matter if I quit? It matters because you don't know what God is going to do with your obedience. You don't know what God's plan is. And oftentimes, we think too short. Our perspective is too limited to see what God really is going to do with our obedience. What I mean is every decision is actually a vote towards your future. Every decision you make is a vote towards the person that you want to be, the person that you will be, the person that you are investing in yourself to be. Each decision you make determines what kind of future you will have. Every time you decide in the moment, you're voting on what kind of person you are. Whatever you decide to do, that's a vote towards that type of person that you're going to be. If you keep doing something that you need to keep doing, you're saying, I am not going to quit. When I commit, I don't quit. I'm going to keep going. And that's also a vote towards you saying, I have what it takes. God has given me everything that I need for life and for godliness. It says that in 2 Peter And so you're saying, I believe your word. I believe that you have given me this this command, this this directive, and so I'm going to do it. I'm going to finish this. When you keep going, you're voting that you have what it takes. On the other hand, when you quit, when you give up, when you stop and you deny your call, when you deny what God has called you to do, you're casting a vote saying, you don't have what it takes. Or you're saying, God, you aren't enough. You can't do this through me. Every decision is building a case toward your future self. So who do you want to be in the future? Here's an important question. When do you quit something and when do you persevere? Because there are things, some things you should quit. There are. I know it's weird in a sermon on finishing something that I'm talking to you about finishing, uh, quitting something. But there are some things that you should quit, right? There are some things that we're doing that aren't in line with the Word of God. There are some things that, are do, that we're doing that aren't honoring God, giving God glory. 
Some things that we should quit are scrolling, procrastinating, drinking, smoking, midnight toking, lying, cheating, stealing, and overcommitting money or time on something we don't need and that we're not called to. So maybe today in a sermon on being a finisher, maybe God is asking you to quit something. But how do you know what you should quit and what you should keep doing? Remember, our decisions are votes on who we're going to be in the future. And so if what you're doing isn't going to advance your calling, isn't going to contribute to what God has called you to do, isn't going to contribute to the purpose that God has called you to, should be in the past, shouldn't be in the present, shouldn't be in the future. Stop doing it. So if you keep doing what you know you need to stop doing, every time you decide to do what isn't in your calling, it isn't in the character of God, you're putting a vote towards uh, your future self saying that you'll be the same then as you are today. And I think if you were to look forward and you were to think, about your future self, you wouldn't want that part of your life to be part of that, to be part of your future self. Change comes only when we make changes. So you choosing to stay the same is another way of saying you don't have what it takes or that God doesn't have what it takes. Every decision for an action is a decision on who I will become. Now, As a person, will I struggle? Will I fail? Will I miss the mark? Of course I will. And if you haven't noticed it yet, then you're sleeping too much in church. Wake up. I'll never be perfect. I'll never be perfect because I'm human. But because God is for me, and because God has given me everything I need for life and for godliness, and he's for you, he's given you everything you need as well. You may see me struggle, but you'll never see me quit. Because when I commit, I don't quit. Because I'm a finisher. Paul says this in Acts 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim, my only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Why could Paul finish the race? Well, it says here, he wasn't running for himself. He wasn't running for himself. He said, I consider my life worth nothing. Today, if you're quitting what God has called you to do, to start, maybe it's because you care more about something else than you do about God's call on your life. Maybe it's that you're elevating something above what God would ask you to do. So let me give you a secret that I need to remind myself of regularly. The only way to succeed in the struggle and in the suffering is if your life is worth nothing. The only way to succeed in the struggle and the suffering is if your life is worth nothing. The Bible says that we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. Christ lives in us. You know what? Dead men have no desires. A dead man's life is worth nothing. But when Christ lives in you, when Christ ministers through you and Christ works in you, then your life is priceless. Paul considered his life worth nothing and that made his obedience to God priceless. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about your desires, your dreams, your bank account, your RSPs. It's not about the vehicle you drive. It's not about your popularity or your reputation. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him. And we lose our ability to finish well when we lose our focus on that simple truth. The moment we take our eyes off of him and put it on anything in this world or on ourselves, we lose our focus and we lose our ability to finish well. Knowing and living out this important aspect of our journey with Jesus makes all the difference. If you learn this and walk it out, it will help you every single day of your life in walking with Jesus. When we commit to him, we don't quit 
because we are finishers. How do you run your race? How do you finish? Well, you don't run it for you. You run it for God. Run your race for God. If you want to finish, here's the secret. Take the next step. Take the next step. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other and just take the next step. You won't be able to finish your race today, but you can take the next step. When you look at the life and ministry of Jesus, when you see every step that he took from his birth to his death and his resurrection, he finished and he faithfully ran for God, taking one step in front of the other. When Jesus was on the cross, right before he looked up to heaven and he breathed his last breath, and right before he said, it is into your hands I commit my spirit, he said, it is finished. It's finished. He did everything the Father sent him to do. He finished the race, and he did it the same way that you and I can do it. He did it for God the Father. Not my will, but your will be done. I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what the Father says. It wasn't about his life. It was about the life that the Father would have for him. He was running for the Father. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, he lived for God the Father. Regardless of how difficult it was, Jesus just kept taking the next step when he was being mocked before his crucifixion. When people struck him on the face, he turned the other cheek and took the next step. When he fell with the cross, he picked himself up, grabbed the cross again, and literally took the next step. And he was on the cross, still being mocked, People are saying, if you really are the son of God, get off, get off that cross. When he was being mocked, he said, Father, forgive them. He took that next step because they do not know what they're doing. We know what Jesus did. Now what are you going to do? The trajectory is always toward what's easy, always towards what is the least difficult thing, and towards what's convenient and what's ungodly. That's, that's how, how it is in this world, because the devil wants you to quit what God wants you to do to start. So predecide when I commit, I don't quit. You need to predecide that. I don't know exactly how that'll play out in your life. I don't know exactly what that will mean for you. However, you are struggling. And wherever you may be suffering, I want to encourage you today, don't quit. Don't quit. Stay in the game. Because when you commit, you don't quit. Take the next step. When you get knocked down, get back up. You no longer live, but Christ lives in you. You're not doing what you're doing for yourself, but you're doing it for God to give him glory. In the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona, there was a sprinter from Britain, and he was one of the favorites to win the 400-meter race. And so when the 400-meter race started, he got off to a great start. He was doing really, really well. And then at the 200-meter mark, right halfway through the race, he tore his hamstring, and he couldn't even walk. He collapsed on the racetrack. And in what is probably one of the most emotional moments in sports history, as he's laying on the track, crying, devastated that his Olympic dreams are shattered, his dad ran out of the stands, picked him up, and walked to the finish line with him. And I want to encourage you with the words from Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you 
will carry it on to completion till the day of Christ Jesus. That means that you, when you run, when you walk, you never run, you never walk alone. The Father is always with us. Just like the Father came down to rescue the Son in 1992, the Father, 2,000 years ago, rescued the Son from the tomb. And the Father and the Son want to rescue you today. Where you are weak, he is strong. You never run alone. When you can't run anymore, look around because he is near. He's running towards you. And why is it that so many people quit? Well, one, I think so many people quit because they feel like they're alone. But we just addressed that. We know we're never really alone. God is always with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He is always with you. You are never alone. And so be encouraged with that as maybe you're, you're tempted to quit. And the second biggest reason why I think people quit is simply because they can, because it's an option. You know, when Kristen and I first started dating and things were getting more and more serious, we said, you know, if this is going to work, we need to not even include divorce in our vocabulary. It can't ever be brought up. We can't ever hint to it. We can't ever say anything about divorce. We can't ever make it an option. Because if it is an option, then chances are it'll be used as an option. And so don't ever make it an option. And there are other things in our lives that should never be options as Christ followers. What if when we knew what God was asking of us that nothing could convince us to quit? Nothing could convince us. Instead of walking away and quitting on God, what if we ran to Him, even in our doubts, even in our fears, even in our struggles, even in our disappointments, and cried out to Him saying, I don't understand. I don't get it. But I trust you. I trust you, God. And I'm not quitting. I'm not letting go. Because you may see me struggle, but you'll never see me quit. Because we are disciples of Jesus. Because he is the ultimate finisher. He is the author, and he is the finisher of our faith. He started it, and he will finish. When I commit, I don't quit. I'm a finisher. Jessica, can you come now, please? So I want to finish the account of the missionary out on the ocean. So there she's stranded out there with two of her companions, and along comes this fishing boat. Man, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm working towards something here. Anyways, let me finish. Uh, so she's out on the ocean with two of her companions. And they're stranded, and this fishing boat comes up with six fishermen. And the fishermen are kind, and, and, and they, they understand what the mission is for these missionaries. And so they take them to the other side. They take them all the way. They minister. But really nothing comes of the ministry over there. Nothing comes. But the fishermen come back. They said, you know, we'll, we'll drop you off. We'll come back for you in a couple days. So they come back, pick them up, and they're taking them back. And on the journey, they get to lead those six fishermen to Jesus. Every single one of those men come to Christ. They start their journey with Jesus. Maybe it wasn't actually about them at all. It was about the fishermen. And so, it's amazing that they didn't throw in the towel. They weren't discouraged. They didn't just ask the fishermen to say, you know what, just, just take us back to our base. We give up, just tow our boat. We'll just, we'll just quit. But they continued on. And even when they didn't see success in what they thought 
was the original idea, what they thought was the original plan for God. They didn't give up. They didn't quit. God had something more for them. Every person before you is an opportunity to be faithful. Here's what I believe will happen. If we'll be sensitive to God, if we will ask Him, what's my unfinished business? Where have I maybe thrown in the towel, Lord? Where have I quit where you haven't asked me to quit? And then also ask God, what do you want me to quit? Are there things in my life that shouldn't be in my future and therefore shouldn't be in my present? Where do you want me to quit? And what do you want me to finish? What did you start in me that you want to see finished? As you are obedient to God, He will come through. Maybe not in the way that you first initially thought He would or he could, or he should, but he will come through for you. Would you please stand, and let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you, you are not a quitter. Thank you, Jesus, for finishing the work that you had here on earth. And Jesus, as your followers, we want to be finishers too. We don't want to give up on your call on our life just because it's hard, just because we're discouraged, and maybe even just because we feel like we're alone. Thank you, Lord, that we are never alone. And Lord, may we never May we never think of quitting as an option. May we continue as long as you are with us, leading us, giving us grace to continue. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stay in an attitude of prayer, with all heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to talk to those that are here today or online and that haven't given their life to Christ, haven't surrendered their life to Jesus. If you'd look back on your life, you'd see that you're not perfect. I don't know the mistakes you made. I only know my own. But you know the mistakes you've made because not a single one of us is perfect. And God is a holy God. He cannot look upon sin. He has to punish sin. But God loved us so much that he provided a way to pay for our sin through his son, Jesus. Jesus alone lived the perfect sinless life. He gave his life as a perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of your sins, of my sins. Jesus died, was buried, and three days later, the stone was rolled away and the tomb was empty. God raised Jesus from the dead. Because of the finished work of Jesus, when you step away from your sins and step toward Jesus, becoming his disciple, God forgives you of all your sins. He makes you brand new. For some of you, today is the start of your journey with Jesus. It starts with one step. Stepping away from your sin and towards grace, towards Jesus, saying, I need your forgiveness, I need your mercy, I need your grace. Those of you who would say, yes, that's what I want, that's what I need, I step away from my old life, I step toward you, Jesus. Today, by faith, I give my life to him. If that's your prayer, he'll hear your prayer. He'll forgive your sins, he'll make you brand new. Those who say, yes, I'm taking that step, I give my life to Jesus. If that's your prayer, lift your hand up right now. Amen, I see that hand, I see that hand. Any others want to give their life to Jesus, surrender to Jesus today? Don't worry about 
Your neighbors don't worry about what others are seeing or saying. Their eyes are closed. They're looking down. It's just you and God. If you want to give your life to Jesus, lift up your hand. If you're online, just say, type in the comments, I want to give my life to Jesus. Now, everyone, please join me and pray. Heavenly Father, I surrender to you. Jesus, forgive my sins. Save me. Be the Lord of my life. Help me to start following you. Doing your will. Showing your love. My life is not mine. I give it to you. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your love. Thank you for new life. I give you mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's welcome those into the family of God today. Amen. Now we're going to move into a time of community. If you could take your seats. Did everyone get elements as they were coming in this morning? If you did not get elements as you were coming in, would you just raise your hand? And, oh, got some up here, guys, in the front. Greeters are grabbing some more at this time, and we'll get them to you guys. So just, yeah, if you could just keep your hand up if you still need one. And if you just gave your life to Jesus this morning right now, we would love to give you these elements so you can celebrate with us as well. If you are not from this church, but you are in the family of God, if you are a believer, you are a Christian, you are welcome at the Lord's table with us this morning. So those needing elements, again, please put your, up, put up your hand up here in the front. And so the Bible also tells us to examine our hearts, to look inwards, to see if there's any unforgiveness in our lives, to see if we're harboring any bitterness, see if there's any unrepentance in our lives. And so let's take a minute and let's just ask God, is there any unrepentance? Is there any unforgiveness? Is there any strained relationships in my life that I need to work through before we have communion? So if there's some relationships that you need to mend, there's something you need to repent of, you can repent right now. Something you need to ask for forgiveness for, you can do that. But if there's someone that you need to talk to besides God, I would encourage you to do that before you join with us in communion. Just set that aside and join us next time. Because it's important to restore those relationships. It's important to work through what you need to in your relationships. But if you're ready this morning to join communion, to celebrate the Lord's table with us, I'll give you a little instruction on this. There's a, a clear layer with some purple uh, printing on it. You want to peel that back first, not the foil layer, just the clear layer to reveal the wafer. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, we see Jesus leading his disciples in the Lord's Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it. And gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This 
is my body. Let's take and eat the body of Christ. Now, if you'll peel, peel back that foil layer, and then Jesus took the cup, he gave thanks, and offered to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's take up the cup together. Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, that you died for our sins. You died so we could be whole. You died so we could be in fellowship together. Father, we celebrate what you have done. And we honor what you have done by loving one another by laying our life down for you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.